Welcome to the 902 podcast, the official podcast of the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office in Lincoln, Nebraska. I'm Captain John Vick, and I want to thank you for tuning in. This podcast will give you an inside look at LSL with topics and guests to discuss public safety issues impacting Lancaster County. Be sure to subscribe for highlights on news cases and the people working for you at LSO. You can also follow us across social media by searching for at LSO Nebraska. That's at LSO Nebraska on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. The duties which a police officer owes to the state are of a most exacting nature. No one is compelled to choose the profession of a police officer, but having chosen it, everyone is obliged to live up to the standard of its requirements. To join in that high enterprise means the surrender of much individual freedom. And those were words from someone who went on to be President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge, just over 100 years ago, but certainly something that is relevant to our profession today and, uh, and especially to our topic today. We're going to be talking about the Professional Standards Division at the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. But to do that, we've got Sheriff Wagner, Chief Deputy Houchin in the house. Good afternoon. How's it going? It's going good. I'm slightly uncomfortable because usually I'm the one that gets to ask the questions. Um, but this one's about my division. So I'm, we're, we're turning the tables a little bit. I'm, I find myself in the hot seat today. Okay, so be quiet for a minute. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll, do my, I'll do my best. So, I'll, John. Yes, Sheriff. Tell us about yourself. Where are you from? Gosh, this, is, this is like a, I feel like I'm getting hired all over again. That's we, right. It feels yeah. like we've had this conversation before. Um, I, I consider myself a Lancaster County kid. Uh, I, was, I was originally born in Iowa, but I made my way here uh, in high school. I actually graduated up at uh, Raymond Central High School and uh, up in the northwest part of Lancaster County. And um, ever since um, I've, I've been here in Lancaster County, um, I, I, after graduation, I joined the uh, Nebraska Air National Guard, and uh, right here in Lincoln at the uh, in the Security Forces Squadron there. So it's a military police unit here in Lincoln. And when I signed up, it was actually July of two thousand one, and everybody knows what happened. It's just a couple of months after that, nine eleven happened, and so my my future looked a little bit different after that. Um, but uh, I went to basic training and the Air Force Police Academy came back and got placed on active duty and um, spent, I guess, the better part of the next year working at the Lincoln Air Force Base or Lincoln Air National Guard Base, Air Force Base, and um, watching watching airplanes, uh, things like that. So uh, our whole unit was activated. We had several people go different places and things, but I spent my war in, in Lincoln for the most part and then was able to move... Uh, off active duty and, and went to college after that. After, after your military career, then, then what did you do and what led you to law enforcement? So after, I, I'd, I stayed in the Air Guard all the way up until I started here, actually. Okay. I, I was in for a six-year enlistment and I I'm, I'm enjoyed my time there, but I was, I was ready for something, something different. Civilian law enforcement kind of appealed to me. I looked at a few different majors in, in college Tried a few different things. Started out, I think it was a history major or something like that. I was pre-law at one point. And, uh, anything to do with broadcasting or anything like that, John? I ended up getting, I, I minored in communication. Oh, um, I thought you minored in, in flop, bouquet arrangement. Uh, that, was, that was an elective. Oh, okay. That was an gotcha. elective. Okay. I, had, I had to fill out my, okay. my full repertoire of, but yes, much to my, my wife's, um, you know, it, girlfriend at the time, but she benefited greatly from my my floral design class that I took my senior year. So, but I got my degree in psychology. Um, no intention to be a psychologist, but, uh, being a law enforcement officer was, was something that was on my, on my list. And, you know, I, I, ever since I was a kid and Norm Binger, Norm, if you're listening to this podcast at some point, I think the statute of limitations is probably over on this. And I don't know the Iowa state patrols, policy manual so i'll just i'll just i'll just assume that this was probably legit but back in the 80s i, I went on my first ride along when i was a, a child I, I don't even remember what age but but it was a family friend um in iowa and uh we got to go on a very short ride along in in norm's iowa state patrol car and 
that that was a very very pivotal moment in my my young shaping mind and you know ever since then growing up playing cops and robbers things like that um which one were you i was usually the cop okay yep i was usually the cop i tried to be a little bit more straight laced than the robber but that uh it's one of the first things i ever remember wanting to do in high school you'll remember i you know i I didn't work here till i was 22 23 years old but i mean i've been volunteering here at the office since I was probably 15, 16 years old. Manny Bartek was a deputy, did our crime prevention stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was interested in, in that. I, I had some friends who were, whose parents were deputies. Um, so I, I'd kind of been around the office a little bit. So when it came time to apply, this was really the only place that, that I wanted to work. And I figured, well, if, if it doesn't work there, then I'm just, I'll try something else. But I'll maybe go be get into floral design or something yeah, like that. Okay. But probably so missed your calling there, John. Maybe. It 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 could be. So it, it certainly wasn't it certainly wasn't podcasting back then. That was not the plan. So tell us about your career path at LSO. Well, uh, I remember John, I did his polygraph. And, oh boy, we're gonna talk about that. Oh, no, but we won't go in depth on that part <laughs> of it. You know, I'm I'm sworn to secrecy on those kind of things. But you did the polygraph, but we waited, what, six months? Till he graduated from college. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, <laughs> this was back in the days when, you know, we had several hundred people apply for, mm-hmm. for a vacancy. And, and I had never applied to a law enforcement agency before, but I, I wanted to at least get a little bit of experience because I didn't know how I would do. Um, but I knew it was something that I wanted to try. So I still had a semester left of school. And um, I got some, some very good advice at the time of, you know, John, if they offer you this job, you need to you need to make sure that you can finish school. And I, because I, because normally, you know, you go to the academy after you get hired. You do. You're not not even in town for 16 weeks. When you get in the field training program, you bounce around from shift and days off. To yes. It's very difficult to attend classes on a regular schedule. So mm. and yeah, it's it's tough it's tough to do that. And I think some people that that had maybe walked down that road before knew. I think my original answer was, oh, well, I can always just get back to school. You Mm -hmm. know, I can always finish. It's only a couple hours. I can always finish school. Well, life will get you. Thankfully, thankfully, I, uh, I opened my ears a little bit to that. And, and I remember sitting in your office with chief deputy Bill Jarrett at the time, because that question came up. Mm -hmm. If you, if you get offered this job, what are you going to do? Yeah. And I think I, I think I took a big breath and kind of gulped and said, well, sir, I, I really need to finish school. And I think you guys kind of played with me a little bit. Um, so I think I said, so you don't want this job very bad. Uh, yeah. I think that's it, probably what it, I said. It yeah. probably was something like that. And, you know, um, as, as, as fate would have it, I was very blessed that uh, there happened to be a retirement waiting in the wings. I think it was Captain George Lawners at the time um, was looking at retirement later on down the year in December. And uh, I was able to get a, a conditional offer that was conditional on his retirement. And so I was able to finish my last semester of school while he was finishing out his last semester of sheriffing. And uh, it, it just all worked out. So yeah. thank you for that. Okay. So after you got hired and, and went to the academy mm-hmm. and uh, you were number one in your class at the academy? Yes, I was. I think Ben was too. Yeah. Yes. You were on the wall. I am on the wall. Okay. Yeah, so, I, y- yes, the academy. I had, a, I had a lot of fun at the academy. Um, still in touch with some classmates there. Went out there to Grand Island. Um, got back. Rob Soflin uh, was my first FTO when I got back. I started okay. started on a Sunday on day shift with Rob, and um, I, I think, it, I think we were you know out the door heading code three somewhere before for too long that shift i mean and it was it it rob's um i'm so glad that i was with rob because rob really kind of set me up for um i I think just the the pace that that this rob's pretty intense rob yeah he can he can be intense and and it was good to have some exposure to that sort of pace right out of the gate um because otherwise it's i think ben you've always said 
It's a lot easier to pull you back than it oh, is yeah. to fire you up. And, uh, and yeah, it's, yeah, it's easier to pull the reins back than prod them. Yeah, and Rob's definitely one that, that can help you get fired up. So, yeah, I I started. Um, I think I I think I wrote out the rest of my time on um, on day shift after I got done with FTO. Spent some time in a contract town, and then I was on I was on third shift, like a lot of people are um, for a while, until somebody rolled the dice and took a chance on me in criminal. Thank you, Ben. And uh, I got to go to criminal uh, investigations fairly early in my career and after a couple of years. Um, but then I spent some time in criminal, um, all kinds of different exposure to different stuff in there, uh, came back out and then I became an FTO, um, back when I returned to patrol and, and then not too long after that took a promotion to Sergeant and spent some time in patrol. Um, well, you were on the crash team before that, weren't you? Uh, that was actually not until I was, not until I was a Sergeant. Oh, so, okay. um, okay. yeah, there was, uh, Brent Moore um, stepped off that team, and, and okay. it, it had kind of always been something I was interested in. So I uh, try to be useful. You know, we had John Brady on the podcast. He was try, talking about trying to make yourself useful, so yeah. that's what I was trying to do. And uh, I, I enjoyed that. Um, bounced around a little bit from patrol. I did spend some time in, in court services division and uh, was a supervisor in there. And then actually was the, the personnel and training sergeant, uh, for a short time. Oh, I forgot you did that. Yeah, just just before I I took a promotion to captain. So I okay. I got promoted to captain in 2017, and um, have been in. We'll talk about that when we get into the professional standards thing. But I've been in that pretty much the same role. It was the civil division back then, um, but uh, then transition to the professional standards division when we started that up uh, within a year after that. So. Hey, I'm Captain John Vick with the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. When it comes to your career, don't settle for good enough. Don't settle for ordinary. We won't either. Be different, be better, be exceptional. Start your future today at joinlso.com. That's a good segue. Yeah. How, how did professional standards come about? Right. Because then it, the, the practices were in place, but it just wasn't codified under one division command. Correct. And y you guys would have a lot more historical context to this than I would. But when I started, there was a, a personnel and training unit. And, and I don't even think it was a unit. It was a, it was a deputy. It was one, one person. Yes. Yeah, for a long time, yep. it was one person. It was. And, uh, and I would imagine that, that prior to that, it was maybe just kind of an ancillary duty, um, you know, well, you know, our turnover was very low, so yep. we didn't hire on a regular cycle like we are now. Yep. We might only hire once a year, twice a year, uh, if you know, if, if the need arose. Yes. So, um, yeah, it, you're right. It was uh, it was an ancillary duty that happened a couple times a year, and then yep. move on to, the, to their other regular duties. Now, were they under the chief deputy more than anybody else at that time? Do you remember? You know, I'm trying to think when I got hired, um, there was a lieutenant that did handle all of that testing. And um, and I don't know what the chain of command was then, but I would imagine it would have been to the to the chief deputy sheriff. Certainly since, you know, since I've been here, the chief deputy has always been in very close contact with the personnel and training deputy. I mean, yeah. at the time, um, they also did all of our, all of our equipment procurement. Um, issuing equipment to deputies, testing, yep. and so yeah, lots of different hats in that realm, and uh, yeah, so the chief deputy was usually the direct line of command. Because so, eventually we got a sergeant and a deputy yep. in that positions. Yeah, and when I started, it was still just a, just a single deputy, and yes, like you said, they added a sergeant in there, and that's when it was part of the administrative services division. So I think. You know, they had some some shared duties that were beyond just the, the personnel and training stuff. But I think that's a to answer your question, that's a big it's a big part of why this has continued to evolve because it seems like we have our operational divisions downstairs for the most part. So our, our patrol, criminal investigation, court services, those are the those are the functions that most people think of when they think of a law enforcement mm -hmm. agency. But then we also have a lot of 
administrative roles that kind of make the engine work behind the scenes. And um, there's always been, at least in the time that I've been here, kind of a some load shifting when it comes to trying to balance all those duties because there's a lot that goes on. I mm-hmm. had no idea how, how much was involved yeah. in it until I, I really moved upstairs. And so what what was once an ancillary duty, chief deputy, single, single deputy, we added a sergeant. Uh, around the time that I came into the picture, at least uh, as the personnel and training sergeant, there had already been a, a combination of, that was around the time that they had combined our our civilian staff uh, for civil and records. Okay. And then we actually moved the personnel and training unit into the civil division. And so you had civil deputies and then personnel and training deputies and a sergeant. And okay. they kind of kind of split those civilians and the, and the commission staff. So when, after I got promoted, um, Captain Josh Clark uh, was kind of my counterpart with the administrative services division at the time. We were, we were still struggling with some of that balancing workload and things like that. And we were also having some issues with you would, you would have civil deputies in one division that would be working with civilians in a different division. And when you had an issue with a paper or something like that, there was just always this, this weird chain of command thing where you'd have to go to... Kind of a lack of accountability. Would be what well, and, and, and yeah, you know, did, did the problem start? If, if there was an issue, did the problem start here? Did it start there? And you, you just had a lot of people involved in trying to sort it out. So Captain Clark and I were working to try and figure out how can we bring that process back under one roof. At the same time, there was also just a big push in the law enforcement community for, and, and there, there always has been, but I think it just became more and more important now in the 21st century, this, this really drive for standards, accountability, uh, making sure that we were being responsible, transparent to the public. And I, I don't want to say it was a fad. I, I hope it's more than a fad. But I, I think it became really important that we were putting more emphasis and attention into training our people well, hiring our people well, and then equipping them with what they need to be successful ultimately to accomplish our mission. And then holding them accountable. Yes. You know. and, and that's certainly a piece of it yep. as well uh, mm-hmm. to do that. So... That really was the birth of the Professional Standards Division, and that happened in November of 2017. I think we wrote up a proposal for it, and uh, the command staff reviewed it. I think we probably made some tweaks to it, some okay. questions, and that's that's where it started. And it has continued to evolve. Yes. And, um, you know, the legislature has mandated, I think, when you took over the division, um, the only mandatory continuing ed requirement for, was for elected sheriffs mm-hmm. and it was 20 hours per year. Um, and, um, and then that evolved and became 20 hours a year for all law enforcement officers. Mm-hmm. And then that has evolved to now 40 hours per year with a number of different topics being taught, um, in, in a, you know, given number of hours in each topic that has to be required, has to be accomplished every year so that's really complicated things in in professional standards a little bit and so yeah, that's part of the reason why you know the division has evolved but it's also grown um, because mm-hmm. they're what what was once maybe a simple somewhat simple function um has a lot of moving parts now and so not only do we have the hourly requirement but there are certain categories of training certain types of training uh different certifications that we have to keep up and those things have just become more and more complex and, and with complexity comes um, throwing, you know, a, a f- some more resources at the problem. And, and sometimes those resources come in the form of, of people. Sometimes they come in the form of time and having a division allows us a lot more flexibility to be able to, to meet that demand. Well, the one thing with this division is it's got a lot of responsibilities that aren't related in any way, shape or form, you know, mm-hmm. buying equipment, and performing a internal investigation are on two different spectrums, but you're responsible for those areas. The best way that I've reconciled it in my mind is that the professional standards division's job is to take care of LSO's people. And so that comes from, you know, some of the soft skills, we'll call it, when it comes to recruiting, uh, screening, hiring, investigating, disciplining, um, but then also some of the 
hard skills as far as taking care of our people when it comes to um, training, when it comes to equipping them to go out and do the job, whether that's guns, handcuffs, uniforms, cars, cars, technology. Yeah, body um, cameras is one of the big things that yep. we have going on right now in our day yep. and age. Yep, and so um, so taking care of the office's people uh, is, is really the common thread that kind of holds all those things together. But there's still some other stuff that comes along with that. Believe it or not, doing podcasts is not my main core function of the job. But Well, but, you know, all joking aside, the social media, the advances in social media mm-hmm. and, and the need for us to get to have somebody that could put information out to the public yes. on, and on a real-time basis f- kind of fell onto you. Yep. And, yeah. I, and I, honestly, partly it's because of your age and ability to do that where I don't have the ability to, to do that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, that that and the podcast and some of those other um, communication skills has also fallen on professional standards. Well, and I certainly can't take all the credit for that. There were people that blazed a a very good trail before, before me. Um, you know, we, I think the social media started as an outreach tool to, mm-hmm. to try and attract candidates, things like that. Yep. Um, on the people side of things, keep the, keep the public informed, obviously. Um, and, and that's grown now to, you know, from one or two things to, you know, we've got four different social media outlets now, um, that continues to evolve as, as the world changes. Um, different types of outreach. So the podcast, in addition to just the, the traditional social media stuff, um, we're working towards getting a, a full-time public information officer. And, you know, we were just talking about that recently. The, I think just expectations from the public have changed a little bit too. Um, the wildfires this last yes. fall mm-hmm. was a good example. Um, you know, we have a lot of different agencies that are involved, but when it comes to public safety in Lancaster County, there's really only a few people that are, I shouldn't say a few people, but a few agencies that are tasked with that full-time responsibility. We've got a lot of volunteer fire departments and things like that. Obviously, emergency management does a, a great job coordinating efforts, um, but it, it just seems kind of like a natural fit that when when something is going wrong, they look to the sheriff's office to, to mm-hmm. try and get some information on what's happening in Lancaster County. So, And it's, a, it's really a great tool to alert the public of, things going on for their convenience so they can avoid those areas mm-hmm. for their safety so that they can, you know, not, not, um, you know, uh, cross into danger and, um, and then potentially for their assistance for us, if we need their help as our eyes and ears. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been a really, yeah, the, my, my skepticism on the social media platform has certainly ebbed and it's really been a useful tool and very helpful. And I think the public really appreciates getting those timely updates from us when the interstates closed down, when Highway 77 is flooded, you know, whenever the, whatever the case may be, um, you know, they, I think they appreciate that ability. Well, and we're certainly still still figuring things out. There's a lot of stuff that comes on the scene. We've had a lot of questions about why we don't have a TikTok account, things like that. I don't personally. I'm I'm not jumping both feet into that arena yet but we've we've tried to keep it uh we've tried to keep it of a of an extent that we can manage and and hopefully hopefully do it well um well you can control your message we've talked about that to yeah. be able to get it out yep. and what we want to have out and not being you know having a 20 minute interview with the media and they give two seconds of one thing you said you, you yeah. You can lose control, and this is a way that we can get it back on and get our whole message of what we want the public to know. Yeah. Part of it, too, is law enforcement, I think, in general, has done a well, – I'll, I'll just say it. We, we haven't done a great job of telling our story. How about a poor job? Okay. Yeah. We'll call it a poor job of, of telling our story. And, you know, I, I think one of the division's jobs, too, is is to, to kind of be a defender of our reputation to some extent and, and to try and – not only in the communication realm, but also in that accountability realm. Um, sometimes when we when we screw up, we've we've got to own it. Um, and obviously, sure, if it's it's your job to um, initiate discipline and things like that, and and to follow that through. But the division is also um, has has people assigned to investigate uh, complaints and things like that. 
when uh, when they do arise so that we can get an accounting of the facts, um, sort out, you know, what uh, what took place from what didn't, maybe what should have taken place, and uh, and then you can respond accordingly. So those are all, all ways that we're trying to... The one thing we are lucky about, though, we do not generate a lot of complaints from the public. We don't. No. Um, I, you know, and For an agency of size, and we generate perhaps five or six complaints that end up in internal affairs investigations per year is really unbelievable. And mm-hmm. the thing on that is just because they end up there doesn't mean the deputy did anything wrong yeah. at that point in time, yeah. too. Well, sometimes, you know, sometimes we have um, false allegations. And I, I think it's important, again, taking taking care of an investigation. We have to be neutral. Um, th- that was another reason for the division as well. Right. Prior to that, prior to having a professional standards division, usually investigations were farmed out to a supervisor. Um, in, the, in the division yeah. where the employee worked. Right. Which really makes it difficult. And we wanted to move that to more of a neutral, um, a neutral stance, so that they could take a look at the facts and give you an assessment of of what took place, and not not be clouded by you know necessarily working directly with that person um, every day because there's things that can get involved um, there to sway things one way or the other. So it well, was just yeah, a, and it's just it's so important that employees be you know that they receive the same rights as any other citizen when they're under investigation like that and so yeah you know be that an officer involved shooting mm-hmm. or uh, a complaint of being rude to a motorist I mean, yep. it, it runs the gambit but in between so it's it's important that deputies know they're going to be treated fairly it is and you know ben to your point we're lucky we don't we don't have a lot of these but we've we've talked about this before not everybody gets to be a deputy when they grow up that's true and not everybody gets to stay a deputy and we've lost um we've lost five people five sure. deputies this year uh, since january um for a variety of reasons because they weren't able to uphold the standards that we've set for our employees at the office and the code of ethics of nebraska law enforcement yeah so you know it's um you hear this a lot. Well, you're just investigating your own and things like that. Well, you know, that's, that's true. Um, and, and it's a double edged sword, but the uh, last thing we want in this profession is a bad egg. Right. And the one thing I always, when a, a officer does something wrong and they get fired right away. I mean, we police ourselves very well. And I don't know if the general public understands that the last thing we want to be, uh, ha- have mm-hmm. out there somebody that's hurting the public yep. or, you know, breaking the law or doing any of those things. Well, I think the bottom line is we are very proud of the profession we're in. Yes. It's an honorable profession. And we have, when we have employees who tarnish that reputation or don't act in an honorable manner like they should, you know, we're as anxious to get rid of those folks as anybody else. Well, what do you have? You have a great saying, you know, you make a mistake of the heart or yeah, there's two two kinds of mistakes: um, mistakes of the heart, and mistakes of the head. Mistakes of the head, you can I- increase your training and, and train that mistake, you know, away. But if it's if it's a, a mistake of the heart, if you don't have the integrity, if you don't have uh, the strength of character to be a law enforcement agency, there's nothing we can do to train that into you. Right. And uh, and those are the folks that we need to. Not hire or get rid of if Either we make a mistake. Not hire or, or get rid of them. Well, and I think, yeah, to your point, it it's not just, you know, the, the IA stuff and, and right. investigating. We want to stop problems from coming in the door. Yes. And, you know, you guys have a, a philosophy that uh, that I I very much appreciate, and that's that, you know, we would we would rather go short than lower our standards. And that's that's easy to say. Tough but to do. It, it's tough to do. Um, it's, it's simple, but not easy because when, when we're facing shortages, like we are, and we are yeah. just, just like every other law enforcement agency. And, and I don't want to, you know, call out any, you know, particular agencies or things like that, but let's be honest, there are some agencies that are, that are making some hard choices and, and, and just, hi- hiring some people to, to keep people on the street. Yeah, just to put butts in the seat, they're right. hiring folks who shouldn't maybe be law enforcement officers. And, and we have made a very intentional decision not to do that. And um, Well, in the long run, it can end up costing you way more it can. than just being short. Yeah. Yep. You know, I'd rather pay some overtime and have the right people doing it than putting the wrong ones in there, and we get a black eye because they do something that uh, dishonors the profession. Well, and, and that, 
that goes back to kind of the way that I started. And it's a, again, it's that quote and it's on our, it's on our division webpage. If you go and look at our website, but no one is compelled to choose the profession of a police officer, but having chosen it, everyone is obliged to live up to the standard of its requirements. And, uh, you know, that, I, I think that's just the way that we have to approach our work is that you've, you've chosen this job and, uh, you know, it's, it's a higher standard. You've answered a calling. Yeah. And that's kind of the way I look at law enforcement. It's a calling. Yep. And if you don't, if you're not willing to answer that calling or if you don't see it as a calling, you're not going to put up with the hardships that creates in your personal life. Yeah. Yep. Cause there's sacrifices to it. Yeah. There, there certainly are. So, but uh, you know, I still tell people, I, I think this is the, this is still the best job in the world. Um, you can, you can see the difference that, that you're making every day. And uh, that's something that we try to try to tell recruits uh, when we're out meeting with people and, and talking to people that might be interested in being a deputy, still a great career. Um, today as, as it was back when, back when any of us started. And uh, for someone that does want to make a difference and, and take care of their community, I, I don't think there's a, there's a better place to do it than, than right here at the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office. Can't agree more. Amen. Was that it? Well, you've answered all the questions that we were going to ask. Yeah. So, okay. In a roundabout uh, way. In a roundabout yeah, way. Yeah, in a roundabout way. So, yeah. that, that was the other thing you told me in your office. There was some, some hypothetical during my interview. Okay. Not this interview, but my hiring interview. Okay. Some some question that, well, John, that was a nice job of dancing around the question. Would you mind answering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if the polygraph was worse or my interview with him, but uh, like, well, there goes that. Uh, there goes that job. I guess I'll look for something else now. Uh, got a phone call a couple weeks later. I, you know, I think every employee here can, can tell stories. Probably about, a similar story, right? About those uh, interviews and in, uh, when before they got hired and. And, uh, you know, just so everybody knows, the, the last thing some, that happens to somebody before they get off the job is an interview with the chief deputy and myself. Yeah. And uh, it, it's uh, a little intimidating, I think. It, uh, it is. Well, we get that chair, and it's kind of moist on it after a while. <laughs> there's, a yes. lot of, there's a lot of sweaty handshakes. Sweaty, there yes, there was very yeah, sweaty yeah, handshakes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah, if, uh, I'll use this as a shameless plug, but... If anybody wants to, uh, if anybody wants to talk to us about a career for the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office, whether it's a sworn position, uh, sworn law enforcement position, or one of our civilian professional staff positions, go to joinlso.com. We've got information there, and we've got a number of different vacancies coming up. We're, we're hiring for lateral deputies right now, um, but we'll be opening that for entry level deputies uh, later this fall, probably in August. Um, but we've got a number of of other opportunities coming up. I think we've got. Um, some record specialists positions, two of them. Two of them. Yep, and uh, we just today got a civil, a the civil, civil. specialist uh, position. Hey, what, one thing, John, I'd like to, you know, we have people apply, and there's mm -hmm. certain things that if you've done uh, recently will disqualify you. Can you kind of go over some of those things so that like, people are thinking, hey, I'd like to do this, uh, but, you know, at some point in time, you know, yep. I, I did marijuana when I was in junior high or, or something right. of that. What right. what keeps people off the list other than just plain not telling the truth? Well, and plain not telling the truth is is the biggest one. And I'd always tell people we're, you know, we're not looking for angels. We're just looking for honesty. And, you know, I, I would take someone that's that's lived some life and had some life experiences that maybe has made some head mistakes, but, uh, but, but isn't going to make heart mistakes. Yep. And so we can work with that stuff. Now there are some, there are some state requirements, especially when it comes to the deputy uh, positions about drug usage and things like that. Um, marijuana is typically any marijuana use within the last two years. Um, criminal, other criminal convictions, criminal convictions first, are, uh, yep. Uh, first felonies, years. felonies, um, or out. class one misdemeanors. Those are, those are going to be disqualifiers. Um, you know, drug use of, of prescription drugs or, uh, or, you know, illicit drugs and things like that. Usually it's five years, um, depending on the circumstances. There are some times um, that we can, that, that a waiver might be, might be a possibility, but we just, we have to talk about it. Right. And, um, but the biggest thing is I, I just, I tell people we're looking for honesty. If, if you made some, some mistakes or maybe some things that maybe they weren't even mistakes, just things you aren't proud of, who hasn't? And uh, I would much rather you have a, uh, you know, live some life and 
and be able to relate to to people in our community because uh, people are going through all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, people are struggling with finances, with addictions, things like that. Um, having having some exposure to different things in your life, as long as it doesn't disqualify you, is is only going to help you uh, to be able to relate to people. As long as it's not a character flaw. Correct. The one thing on these on on people wanting to become a deputy, though, if if you know you want to be, go into law enforcement, probably not the time to start smoking weed during that time. Hundred percent, hundred percent. You yeah. know, at, at that point in time, when we're doing those interviews, one of the questions we'll ask you is, you knew you wanted to be a police officer. Why are you out smoking weed? Why are you out doing what? Yes. You know, shoplifting. Why are you doing what? You know, yes. what not? Yes. Set some goals. Yes. Align your uh, align your behavior Which, to to the, achieve to those profession. goals. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it, it it's going to take some. I, you know, I don't view that as sacrifices, but but yes, I mean, you're going to have to. Um, you're going to have to make some choices in your personal life if this is a career that uh, that you want to do. Yeah, yes. if you're hanging around friends, even if you don't, that are doing a whole bunch of yes. illegal stuff um, from stealing or marijuana or or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, you may need to. Uh, cut those relationships at that point in time because it's just not going to fall into uh, what you want to do. Yeah, we just need need people with a good head on their shoulders, good character, honesty, integrity, and uh, be willing to serve the public. So. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode of the 902 Podcast. You can find more information about the Lancaster County Sheriff's Office and career opportunities here by going to joinlso.com. Also, check us out on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at LSO Nebraska. You can also reach us via email by sending an email to lso at lancaster.ne.gov. Be sure to follow or subscribe for future episodes of the 902 Podcast. Thanks for listening.